Medicine, uh, Colby's journey was in medicine was profoundly shaped by a personal experience, feeling a mission to make a difference in the lives of others. Colby's resilience and empathy were strengthened by a life-changing event, a heart transplant necessitated by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Inspired by a desire to transform his own health challenges into a purposeful calling, he pursued a medical education leading to a cardiology fellowship at UMass Chan Bay State. In order to give back and raise awareness, Colby has founded the nonprofit organization The Beat Goes On, which supports transplant recipients financially and advocates for organ donation. Colby's journey demonstrates the transformative power of resilience, compassion, and dedication in the face of adversity. Will you please join us in welcoming Dr. Colby Salerno. Colby! First, I'd like to thank the Heart Rhythm Society for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. At the age of 14, I decided I wanted to be a cardiologist. And growing up in New England, I'm humbled to be standing here in Boston in front of a room of cardiologists and other healthcare professionals. Being a cardiologist, and for many in this room, an electrophysiologist is the best job in the world, and I'm here today to remind you of that. It is not because you went to medical school just to then become a professional video gamer. It is the <laughs> impact that you have on the patients and the ability you have to give people their life back. <clears throat> this is me. If I had my own Netflix series, I feel like it would start with me in this situation. I would come in as a voiceover saying, you're probably wondering how I got here. And I know what you're thinking. And no, this is not after a routine generator change. <laughs> <laughs> This is me at the age of 24 after my heart transplant. If you look closely, you can see I'm flexing. That's my mom there too, flexing with me. And I feel like this is a perfect representation of how I tackled my heart disease throughout my whole life. To understand who I am today, you have to understand what I have gone through. If you look at this brief timeline of my life, you'll see a snapshot of some of the big patient and doctor steps I have taken. In 2000, at the age of 12, I was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I got my first ICD at the age of 14 in 2002. I went on, read, led a relatively normal life, and graduated from college, St. Michael's, up in Vermont. However, right after college, I had hoped to go to medical school, and I was told I needed a heart transplant. Medical school was on hold. In 2011, I ended up hospitalized for six months while I waited for my heart transplant. Soon after, as you see, two years only, I decided, let's go, and I got into medical school. I started my internal medicine residency in 2018 at UMass Bay State and stayed there to start my cardiology fellowship. I graduate next month. To my knowledge, I'm the only cardiologist in the world who's had a heart transplant. If you know another one, I would love to meet them, but I've yet to find one. In <laughs> two months, I start my final year of fellowship at Yale, where I'll be doing advanced heart failure and transplant. This is a photo from the Disney movie, Inside Out, and here we are seeing a core memory. I feel like we see this all the time now on social media, people documenting what they feel as core memories being made in that moment. I want you to think about being 14 years old and think about a core memory that's come to mind. As you saw in 2002, I was 14 and had my first transplant. I would like to tell you about my core memory. I am deep in the woods with about six friends of mine. We're playing paintball. We spread out and I'm walking on my own, trying to be stealthy, and of course, the adrenaline is running. As I am moving along, I feel this punch sensation in my chest. Check my chest to see if I was hit with a paintball. Nothing. I try and see if I'm hit in the back. Nothing. Then I think to myself, could that have been my defibrillator? Couldn't be, right? So I do what I, any 14-year-old boy would do. I keep going, try and find my friends, and shoot them with paintballs. <laughs> I come up to them. Most of them have been hit, but I see them and they don't see me. Of course, the adrenaline is really going now because I'm about to get them all. I'm, pre <clears throat> I'm creeping up on them and then, bam, punched again and knocked off my feet. I sit there shocked, scared, not sure what to do. I'm trying to take some deep breaths to calm down, and then, bam, 
Well, now it feels like I'm getting hit by a hammer. So I start, <clears throat> so I start screaming for my friends. The defibrillator would go on to shock me six more times in a matter of moments. As I am deep in the woods, surrounded by six 14-year-old boys, as their friend is screaming out in pain and fear, I ended up being carried out on a stretcher by like five firefighters and rushed to the hospital. Since I know all you EP nerds are wondering, it was inappropriate shock. <laughs> I had hit the heart rate threshold because of my adrenaline rush. That was 22 years ago, and I still remember it this well. Core memory, indeed. The reason I tell you this story is because this story, like many others I could tell, are memories that are stuck with me forever. And I'm sure there are millions of patients out there just like me with core memories as a result of their medical conditions. When we make decisions as physicians, we must remember the impact we have on our patients' lives. We do this day in and day out. Pacemaker placements, ablations, ICDs, CRT, it's second nature to us. For our patients, it is everything. It consumes them. It becomes their identity. You may identify as an electrophysiologist. I know many patients who identify as transplant recipients or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. My point in all this is as physicians, we can get bogged down in the day to day, the number of procedures we have to get through to get to the end of the day, the number of clinic patients we need to see, the number of notes we need to write, the number of bills we need to code for. I implore you to remember the 14 year old whose life was changed by an ICD placement and that every patient encounter could be life-changing for that person. They could end up idolizing their pediatric cardiologist and standing in front of you one day at an HRS meeting. But what makes me an expert? Well, in all honesty, nothing really. I'm just <laughs> one patient with my opinions, but I have lived both, lived both sides of the stethoscope. That's the name of my podcast. Check it out if you would like. <laughs> and I will say, I got the patient thing side of things pretty figured out. Here I am in the hospital waiting my heart transplant on my 24th birthday. It's a birthday I'll never forget. I had to blow out candles that were not lit. <laughs> I got to have my dog visit. I decorated my room for New Year's, very messy, like a 24 year old living in a hospital. I got to meet Santa. As you can see, I'm wearing a Celtic shirt. I'm not even a Celtics fan, but yeah. <laughs> And there I am with my other fellow patients. As you can see, we're roughly the same age. <laughs> and here I am. So I had lived in the hospital for six months. I was, an attached, I was attached to a swan catheter and IV 99.9% .9 of the time. I got one real shower and never stepped outside. I became an expert on what patients go through and I fully believe I am a better physician for it. Not often will you find a cardiologist covering the stress lab and having a stress test completed in the same two week period. It is moments like this that really allow me to connect with my patients. I've been intubated, cathed, shocked by my ICD, had a Foley, open heart surgery, you name it. When I sit down with my patients, I know the importance of my words and my actions. I do understand that I'm unique in this. We can't have every doctor in this room go get cardioverted, ablated, or have a device placed. <laughs> I can hope, though, that my words will impact you and that you will remember the importance of the career choice you made and the impact you have on a day-to-day -day basis. This is me right before I was wheeled down for my heart transplant. My goal at this moment was not to be alive, but it was to live, and live I have. Here I am, graduating from medical school, giving a talk just recently at ACC in the electrophysiology theater of all places. <laughs> and there I am speaking in Western Mass about my podcast and my lived experience. Here I am again. What did heart transplant give me? Well, it gave me the ability to hike mountains in Hawaii. I took up skiing after my transplant. I learned, I, not learned, I ran a 5K very soon after my heart transplant with the nurses and techs of the floor that I used to work on as a unit secretary because I was too symptomatic to do any other job in the hospital. And to me, most importantly, it allowed me to get married and have kids. <laughs> Thank you.
Those are my boys. Uh, what's important about them is they don't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <laughs> Due to my health literacy and modern science, I made sure that I found my gene mutation, MYH7, checked the embryos, implanted the embryos, and because they were, the embryo was so perfect, and split in half and gave me two of them. And those are my <laughs> <laughs> boys. The next time you find yourself stuck in clinic or bogged down by notes or stuck in a really long, complex ablation case, please remember the patient under the drape. You are giving them their chance not just to be alive, but to live. Thank you. Thank you.